guys are ready for the word? Yes. That's good. We had been seeing a fresh look at the cross, a fresh look at the atonement, a fresh look at God's heart in the atonement. Uh, that's so important for us to know the heart of God behind the atonement, behind the sacrifice of Jesus. Because when we misunderstand that, we misunderstand the nature of God, we mi misunderstand the heart of the Father. As a result, we misunderstand, no, note that word, we misunderstand ourselves. Yeah, we misunderstand ourselves and we act accordingly because we, at the end of the day, we live out our belief system. So, uh, the penal substitution view of atonement tells that God was angry with mankind and uh, because of sin, but Jesus came in and received the wrath of God and he absorbed all the wrath in his body and now, you know, God is happy because there is no more wrath left because all the wrath was absorbed in, absorbed in the body of Jesus. Uh, which primarily is being told that way so that we can keep the justice of God in balance with the love of God. But just imagine that if somebody has wronged you um, and uh, uh, what is justice? You know, what would be justice? You know, is, is just in, in human terms, what would be justice? Okay, punishing that person would make sense. You punishing somebody who is innocent for the sake of somebody else who is guilty is no way justice. Are you getting what I'm telling? If you have come and wronged me, I can't pull somebody else and slap him and look at you and say, I forgive you. That is not forgiveness. That is not justice at all. In fact, you know, when you come to Isaiah 53, you know, which is a pivotal passage as far as uh, understanding the atonement is concerned, we had looked at few verses, the first few verses, um, the last time I preached. Um, we, we saw that, you know, it was, he was wounded by our transgressions. You know, the word for is actually by, uh, he was wounded by our transgressions. He was wounded, you know, by uh, uh, our iniquities. He was bruised by our iniquities and all these things. And um, he was, was, was eight, verse eight. Or let, let's read it in Amplified, verse 4. Let's read verse 4 from the Amplified. Surely he has borne our griefs, sicknesses, weaknesses, and distresses, and carried our sorrows and pains of punishment. Yet we, what is the word there? Yet we ignorantly, say ignorantly, <laughs> yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, smitten and afflicted by God. So it was an ignorance on our end that made us conclude that he was smitten, he was bruised by God. It was not God. And verse 8 says, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, in fact, if you read it in another version, it says, you know, justice was taken away. So injustice was happening. So the whole view of the cross is not a matter of justice in the sense, but it's a matter of human injustice because somebody who was innocent is being tormented the way he was tormented. But the problem is with verse 10. You know, uh, if you read it from New King James, it, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. You see, if there is one particular verse in the entire Bible 
where we can point out saying that it was God who punished Jesus on the cross. It is Isaiah 53.10, which says, It is the will of the Lord, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he has put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. But if you go in, read it in NASB, New American Standard Version, or uh, NRSV, a few words, few versions that have been come of late and if you see the footnote of those uh, translation you would find something like Hebrew text not clear it says Hebrew text not clear so the Hebrew text is not really clear so they, they this verse alone is just interpreted the way it has been interpreted so long you know uh, as as though it is God's will to bruise Jesus but if you see um, uh, the disciples during Jesus time do you know in what language they read the Old Testament? They read it in Greek. Paul used a Greek version of the Old Testament to make all the quotation because, you know, he, he, he writes in Greek and he has made so many quotes from the Old Testament. So what version of the Old Testament did he use? He used the Greek version of the Old Testament to write the New Testament. So when you go and read the Greek version of Isaiah 53.10, you know, uh, you, you can Google it or you can find it in um, Bible Hub. Yeah, uh, BibleHub.com. There, the Greek version of Isaiah 53.10 goes like this. The Lord also is pleased to purge him from his stroke. Did you listen? What, what does it say? The Lord also is pleased to purge him. Purge means cleanse him, to cleanse him, to heal him from his stroke, from his plague. So it was the humans who punished Jesus on the cross and it was the will of the Lord to purge Jesus of his plague. Quite the opposite of what we usually read and saying that, you know, it was the Lord's will to crush him. It says it, it pleased the Lord to purge him. Our understanding of the scripture is very, very vital. Um, in fact, we have our understanding of scripture so rigid and we try to fit our God into the understanding of the scripture rather than having God as the constant and having the understanding of the scripture as the flexible element and put it upon God. I, I think you're not following what I'm saying. Uh, um, let's, okay, let's do this. Let's go to Romans 15. Romans 15. Verse 9, Romans 15, verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Say, Gentiles, Gentiles. might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. If you, if you go and read the entire uh, chapter of Romans chapter 15, the point that Paul was trying to make was there is no Jew-Gentile thing that God has made everyone together so that Gentiles can also glory in the Lord for his mercy and say, I will praise his name. But the quotation, as it is written, uh, uh, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, is a quotation from Psalms 18. So come with me to Psalms 18. Yeah? S Psalms 18, I don't have time to go through. You, I want you to go through from verse 41 onwards. Read verse 49, just put, put for verse 49. Therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praise to your name. See, this is the quotation that Paul is using in Romans chapter 15, verse 9. But if you go and read the context of Psalms 18, the whole context is where David is telling, God, thank you for giving my enemies into my hands. 
Thank you for these Gentile nations have been subdued and they are serving me. The nations that are not knowing me, they are ser serving me. And you have avenged, you have done this, you have, you know, uh, made me ruler over them. The, the whole theme there is about Jew and Gentile, you know, thank God, you know, you were on our side so that you subdued them, so you subdued our enemies so that they were under feet. And, and therefore, amidst those Gentiles who have been subdued, I will praise your name. I'll tell you, you are the God who has lifted me up above them, is what Psalmist is saying. But, this, but Paul is recontextualizing the whole thing by just taking that phrase alone, I will praise you among the Gentiles, and putting it in a context here where he's saying there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. I would give you a homework. Go and, you know, pick all the quotations of Paul in the New Testament from the Old Testament and go to the corresponding Old Testament passages and read it in context. I'll bet you every time, almost every time, Paul would have quoted verses out of context. I'll give you one more example. In Romans chapter 15, does it say, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people? Verse number? Ten. Yeah, verse number 10. Okay, uh, the, the next verse is, Rejoice, O Gentile, with his people. Uh, that, that quotation is from Deuteronomy 32, 43. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43. You know, Paul says, again it says, Rejoice, O Gentile, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for his land. See, when Paul is quoting Deuteronomy 32, this avenge and vengeance and this and that, everything he removes. He is just take, picking up what phrase he wants. Rejoice, O Gentile. <laughs> he is removing the violence element of it and quoting it. We usually shout when people preach out of context, out of context, out of context. People who knew the law really well, people who knew the Old Testament scriptures, whenever they heard Paul quoting scriptures like this here and there and, and coming up with a point that is not revealed in the Old Testament, they were all shouting, this guy is not worthy to be a preacher, he will fail in exegesis. He'll fail in his seminary class. He'll fail in the interpretation because he quotes nothing in context. He quotes everything not only out of context, contra context. You know, he's quoting it to prove a point which is exactly opposite of what is being, it is used for in the Old Testament. So why did Paul do that? Why did Paul read Old Testament the way he read? Because Whenever he read the Old Testament, he understood something that jihad is good. Oh. You said J word? Yes, I said that. <laughs> when Paul read Old Testament, what did he understand? Jihad is good. Fight in the name of God. Kill everyone who is against his people. Who told don't 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 have anything to do with the Gentiles. Kill Amalekites. Who told that? Go right? Who insisted that they have to go through Samaria and they should not be punished? Jesus. <laughs> you didn't get what I said. Who said you have got nothing to do with the Gentiles? God. Who said? We have to love them. We have to go to Samaria and heal them. Jesus, who is God. <laughs> the Pharisees didn't have any problem with Jesus healing the sick. The problem they had with Jesus was he was healing on the Saturday. So they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, please obey the Bible. The Bible says Saturday, nothing. But why do you insist that you should heal only on Saturday? 
So Jesus says, is that what the law says? And he goes Saturday and he heals a couple of people more. And these guys are like, Ooh, why are you doing something? So who, who said, uh, who said um, uh, uh, do, uh, that lepers should not come near anybody and should not touch anybody? If he, if, he, if he touches somebody, he can be stoned. Who said that? God. Who hugged the leper? Who is? God. So who said the lady with the issue of blood who is not supposed to come out and touch somebody, if she touches somebody, you know, she will defile somebody else? Who said that? God. Is it? So here is Jesus. A lady comes and touches him. He says, man, I've never seen such a faith. Are you getting the contradiction? So, how do we, what do we make out of these passages? Who asked, who asked God, uh, uh, you know, who, who asked Israelites to kill all these Amalekites and who asked, you know, such violence and all these things in the Old Testament? Look at somebody and say, Bible is like a movie. Say, Bible is like a movie. <laughs> in fact, I won't be wrong if I say it is a movie. It has to be seen as a movie is seen. You know, off late, whenever, uh, see, we, we, we were watching Hercules the other day. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, we were watching Hercules the other day and uh, <clears throat> When you start watching Hercules, you think that old king is a good fellow. And the other guy who is making havoc everywhere and destroying every village is the so-called villain. But halfway through the story, you understand that the so-called hero whom you thought the hero is not the good guy, but he is the villain and the so-called bad guy whom you thought is the bad guy is a good guy. You've seen movies like that? So when you see, keep reading Bible, you know, if you switch it off halfway through or if you go out on intermission and start preaching, look at somebody say, don't start preaching at intermission. <laughs> you know, don't prepare sermons when there is a break. You know, don't prepare sermons when you have just watched first 10 minutes of the movie. You know, you have to understand the whole picture of God, whole counsel of God, of how things have really evolved and how things have really gone, and then come to the conclusion of who God is. So, um, these guys come and question Jesus, is it okay for, uh, you know, for, you know is, is divorce okay? When, when Jesus is questioned that way, is divorce okay, what did Jesus tell? What did he tell? Is divorce okay, what did he tell? He said, in the beginning when God created, he created them male and female and God united them and God said, he who, 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 he who is united by God, let no man separate and then he said, but Moses, say, but Moses. But Moses, because of your hardness of your heart, he said, okay, in the case of such an event, you are okay to give a divorce notice. And Paul also writes the same thing and says, it's okay, you know, on the case of adultery, you know, you can, you know, uh, Give, give divorce and stuff like that. But the question is, when you put the question is this, this way, is divorce right or wrong, you're asking the wrong question. Because that is not the original intent of marriage. That is something because of the fallen nature of humanity and the fallen nature of the system that, that is accommodated within the system. But that is not the original intent. So what do you see, the violence in the Old Testament, you, what do you see in the Old Testament is not the original intent of God. The original intent of God is revealed only in the person of Jesus Christ. And one more important thing is, 
Old Testament guys did not have a good revelation of devil. Neither did they have something good about God. Uh, when, when, when I say good revelation about devil means quality information. I, I'm, are you getting what I'm saying? Uh, don't take me wrong. What is good revelation about devil? <laughs> okay, Quality information. Um, in the entire Old Testament, out of thir all the 39 books put together, the word devil or Satan is, is probably mentioned less than 50 times. Somewhere around 30 to 50 times. I'm not sure. I, I wrote it down. I, I lost the thing. Uh, but it's less than 50. Just imagine. Out of 39 books, how many times that word devil or Satan is mentioned? Less than 30 times. 30. In the New Testament, the word devil or Satan occurs 200 times. <laughs> so in the Old Testament, the concept was everything that happens is of God. Both good and bad origin, origins from, originates from God. Everything is from God. And they didn't have a clear picture of who devil is. In fact, they thought devil is God's PT master. Every school has a PT, you know physical education trainer and uh, you know I, I went to Virdhinagar and I went to my school the only staff that has remained all through these years is the PT master <laughs> every other staff has been you know that they have gone or they've been removed or whatever the case be but this guy still remains the same yesterday today and forever <laughs> and uh, uh, why, you know, th the only thing that my PT master was good at was <coughs> cranking your skull. No, if he gives one narc, it'll, you can feel it on your you know, toe. You know, it's like that. So, whomever the principal wants to punish, he will call you and send you to the PT master. Principal is not going to punish you. Principal will judge you and say you've done wrong, but the punishment is carried out by the PT master. So this was the view that people had that whomever God wants to punish, he look at devil and say, <laughs> <laughs> basically he was working for God <laughs> for a salary or just voluntary hobby work or something like that. They didn't have this understanding of, you know, how devil came into existence out of something good and, you know, and is against, working against humanity. They, they, didn't, they didn't have this thing. It's all about God. It's all about God. God is one. Everything is about Him. But when Jesus came, He put a difference between Himself and the God of the old, uh, the understanding of the God of the Old Testament. Are you getting what I'm saying? So he, he really made things really, really difficult for people to understand. And, and since they had a rigid understanding of how the scriptures should be interpreted, so they were trying to fit and squeeze God inside the interpretation. But the right way of doing is, let God be God and let your interpretation change as time proceeds. Look at someone and say, let God be God. <laughs> but your interpretation can afford to change. You know, when I was speaking three years before uh, to one guy uh, who is a very famous guy in the city, you know, man of God, I was telling him, you know, he asked me this, Jesu, now you are saying whatever you are saying, Whatever you said so long was wrong. How sure you are that you won't be saying that whatever you are saying right now will be wrong in the next 10 years? I said, at that time I thought, I will not change. I said, no, I have found the gospel of grace. This is the thing. God punished Jesus. He is not going to punish you. Man, it's the truth. 
But now I understand that's not the truth. That's not the truth. God did not punish Jesus. Look at somebody say, God did not punish Jesus. If you don't understand the depth of the statement, listen to the last four week sermons. Okay? So God did not punish Jesus. Now we have to change our understanding of how God functions. So the greatest act of God was revealed on the cross, we think. But it's not on the cross. Even though cross is very, very important. I'm not belittling the work of God on the cross. But the greatest work of God was not revealed at the cross. As I told, any human can die on the cross. And almost every week people were crucified during the time of Jesus. It was the Romans way of executing people. So dying on the cross was not a big deal. So to say. Yeah. So um, the greatest act of God was in the incarnation. When God made himself flesh. When God made himself such a helpless babe. The, for the first time in the entire history, humanity was able to come and look into the face of God without terror. For the first time, people were able to approach God without fear, without any threat, because God made himself so weak. God is so strong in his weakness. He is so strong in his weakness. He made himself so weak and that's where he, his strength was revealed. And that's the reason the Bible says that his foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom. His foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom. So the word incarnate, when, when the word became flesh, see God showed his commitment to humanity. We have an understanding that body is bad. We have an understanding that body is evil. So we all have this thing of, you know, um, uh, our citizenship is in heaven and we are waiting to go to heaven one day. And you no, know, this body is not that good. The spirit, the spirit, the spirit. But God gave a death blow to such of you by becoming body. By becoming human flesh. In the likeness of sinful flesh he came. So he said, you know, don't be really afraid of your weakness. Don't be really afraid of your frailty. Don't be really afraid of all the things that is wrong with your flesh. You know, I, I'm not repelled by the weakness. But I have made myself in the likeness of sinful flesh. So that you can understand that I identify with your weakness too. There is no other God who identifies himself with the weakness of humanity other than Jesus. Because every other God wants to show how powerful he is by be domineering and dominating humanity. But here we see a God who is becoming weak and saying, I am identifying myself with you because I want you to know that how much I love you. So the greatest act of God was the incarnation when he said yes to flesh. When he said yes to flesh. When he said yes to flesh, he said yes to everything that comes with the flesh. That's the reason he went to the cross and he sucked up everything that is wrong. Every guilt, every self-hatred. Why crosses, you know, such a, you know, horrifying death? It is not to appease the heart of the Father. It is not to remove uh, the thing from the conscience of the Father. But within ourselves, we have this God of guilt. We have this God of condemnation who constantly says, you deserve this and you deserve more. Whenever you're going through bad stuff, have you... Listen to that God of condemnation who says, what you're going through, you deserve it. And even worse, you deserve. So when you look at the cross, that God is put to silence. Because whatever we deserved, he received. Whatever we deserved, he received. He sucked everything, everything into his body. He sucked everything into his flesh. 
and he went he went and he went and he died read acts chapter 3 verse 15 acts chapter 3 verse 15 uh, and and killed the prince of life whom god raised from the dead who killed the prince of life who killed come on quick answer me peter is talking to the people in front of him he's saying you guys killed jesus but god raised him from the dead it was not god who killed jesus it was god who raised jesus from the dead and we are witnesses thereof so the disciples witnessed to the fact that god raised him from the dead and the disciples said it was you who killed it was the humanity's wrath that healed, killed jesus listen to me carefully it was the will of god that god should give his life for humanity but it was not the will of god that such violence should happen on the cross you didn't get what i said it was god's will that he would give away his life he said nobody you know can take away my life i will lay it down on my own accord and no there is no greater love than this than person laying down his own life for the sake of the brother so it was god's will that god would lay down his life for our sake but it was not god's will that such violence should happen so the violence involved on the cross was the will of mankind and God used that will of mankind which is revealed in violence and he gave his life and he said yes to all those stuff and he received everything and he died at one moment if you pa pause the movie right there and if you start preaching you would come with a story like evil conquered evil conquered jesus is dead but the story is not about how jesus died the story is about how god raised him from the dead to that we are witnesses so we are witness to the resurrection of jesus so when god raised him from the dead what god primarily did was in at the cross whatever he said yes to at the resurrection he said no whatever he said yes to self-hatred to this and that and this and that and all kind of evil he said yes to on the cross and at the resurrection he said a big no to all those stuff and he recreated the entire universe in him so the, 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 by the resurrection we are invited into, into the triune dance of God you know the father is there the son is there the Holy Ghost is there the father loves the son the son loves the father the son loves the Holy Ghost Holy Ghost loves the son Holy Ghost loves the father father loves the Holy Ghost okay the father is the father because of the presence of the son and the son is called the son because there is a presence of the father father can't be father without the presence of the son and the son can't be son without the presence of the father so there was such dynamics going on within the trinity there was such enthusiasm going on within the trinity there was such life such vibrancy such celebration such joy such perfect flow of love so you know they, they you know within the triune dance they were loved perfectly so god did not want need mankind to love him so mankind was not created out of a need mankind was created out of out of overflow to be shared with since the whole triune family was overflowing with love and life they decided they would share love with mankind with a free being so they created mankind and included him in the triune dance and the whole fall and everything and everything was done within the triune dance and the whole cross and resurrection everything was done done within the triune dance so we can say we won't be wrong if we say that god found us in christ before he lost us in adam Look at somebody and say, God found you in Christ before he lost you in Adam. 
That's why in the book of Ephesians we read, before the foundation of the world, He chose us in Him. Before the foundation of the world, He chose us in Him. He made a choice by Himself. That's why everything that is seen and unseen, visible and invisible, thrones, principalities and powers, everything is held together by Him. So resurrection life invites you to participate in such a life. Resurrection is not just an event. Resurrection is a reality from day to day life. Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus did not say, I will resurrect myself or I will go through resurrection. He did not see resurrection as an event. He saw resurrection as himself. So since he has offered resurrection that is himself into our lives and he has invited you and me into the triune dance of God, you need not stay hopeless in any situation. The cross was such a dark night. The cross was such a dark night. Everything was so dark. Everybody thought God failed. But God won because of the resurrection. So no matter what you are going through, no matter how dark your situation is, you still have hope because you have resurrection in you. Look at somebody and say, you have resurrection in you. You know, we think God became mankind because man sinned. Even though there is an element of truth to it, I don't think that is ultimate truth. I believe even if Adam hasn't sinned, God would have still become flesh. Because the Bible says between God and man there is one mediator. So when you understand that God has to punish Jesus or God has to punish mankind, you understand mediator as two parties, one offended and the one the offender. And the mediator come, coming and standing in between, having talks to both sides and say, okay, this is your problem, okay, this is a problem, okay, I'm going to mediate. You know, we, we have such an idea about, about mediator. But I don't think that's the right idea of what mediator means. Jesus became the mediator means Jesus became the medium. The word incarnate became the medium in which God and man got united together. So he is the medium in which both divinity and humanity found its perfect co uh, you know, communion and, and, and uh, where it found its perfect union. So there is no mismatch between humanity and divinity. When you see Jesus, you see the authentic design. So Jesus did not come to apologize for a faulty design. Jesus came to prove the authentic design. Jesus did not come apologizing saying, Oh, flesh is a faulty design. God shouldn't have made us in flesh. Oh, we sinned because we are in flesh. He didn't come apologizing for flesh. He came in flesh saying, It is the authentic design in which we will dwell together. My time is up. I have to leave. But you didn't understand anything that I said. <laughs> anyway, here is the thing. When God raised Jesus from the dead, he did not raise him in the spirit. God raised him in the body. And he included Jesus with the body in the Trinity and he said, I'm going to be like this forever. So that's, that talks about the eternal commitment of God towards mankind. Eternally, God is telling, man, you are the perfect match for me. You are the perfect temple for me. You are the perfect place in which I can dwell forever. You are the perfect place in which I can dream. You are my dream and through you I dream. And through you I live my dream. Look at somebody and say, you are God's dream. <laughs> you feel so good about yourself when somebody says, I, I dreamt about you. Right? And somebody comes and says, hey, you came in my dream yesterday. Like, wow, really? <laughs> somebody took time to think about me in their sleep. 
But God says, you are my dream. That you are my dream. I'm living my dream when I live in you. And I'm living my dreams through you. And I'm perfectly united with you. So when Jesus took up the bread and he, when he took up the cup, you know, the people, all they had the idea was communion. Commun uh, uh, the, sorry, the, all the idea they had was Passover. Passover. So the death angel, who is God's PT master, they thought, was coming and knocking off everybody. So when, when the death angel looked at the blood, it passed over. So they were celebrating Passover. Oh, thank God for that lamb. Oh, the death passed over. The death passed over. Jesus took up the cup and he said, no longer we are going to call this Passover. We are going to call this communion. Say, come in union. He says, come and understand the union that you are the bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You are taken from my blood. We are together, we are made one, and nothing can separate us. Come in union. You were doing in this remembrance of some death that passed over, but it is not about remembering death that passed over. Do this in remembrance of me. He said, do this in remembrance of me. We have united, we have been perfectly united forever. When Jesus was walking through the streets, you know, he was demonstrating the love of God in every dimension. When he went out to the streets and he looked at people, he said, I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven. The pastors got really irritated. They went to him and said, hey, what are you doing? If you keep forgiving like that, then what will we do with the temple? People have to come to the temple with a lamb, they have to sacrifice and then only their sins can be forgiven and then only we can make money out of the lamb. The last part they didn't say. <laughs> they just said, sacrifice? How? Who can forgive? Only God can forgive and God is inside the veil. Jesus says, exactly that's what I'm telling, only God can forgive. Your sins are forgiven. But that, didn't guy, that guy didn't repent, that guy didn't ask forgiveness, that guy is, is a paralytic guy who is just, you know, just lowered down the roof, who, who got scared because of the process. <laughs> but was not even able to speak because he was so paralytic. Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven, take your bed and walk. So these guys come and make a big issue out of it and says, hey, how can you do this? Then Jesus is asking a question, which thing is easier? Is it easy to say, take, rise up, take up your bed and walk? Or is it easy to say, your sins are forgiven? Which one is easier? If you understand grammar, easier means one is easy, the other is even more. You know, it is easier, okay? So when you say better, it doesn't make the other thing bad. It says the other thing is good. So when I say easier, I'm not saying the other thing is difficult. I'm saying the other thing is easy. So among the easy things that God is speaking, he's talking about rise, take up your bed, and your sins are being forgiven. And God is saying, your sins being forgiven is such an easy task. Be forgiven. For these guys, understanding, you no, know, the forgiveness of sins is so difficult because you have to go through with the blood and you have to go and say, you do not know whether you will you'll be striking, you have to have this rope and then... Oh, forgiveness is such a big pain on the neck. You don't know what forgiveness is. You can't be forgiven like that. He's saying, which easy thing you're talking about? Look at somebody say, God loves you. He has got great plans for you. You know, his heart goes out for you. When you understand that he was never angry with you to begin with. So the cross does not change God's mind regarding you. The cross changes our mind regarding God. 
and our mind regarding ourselves that we are the authentic design. We are not inherently evil. We are inherently good, believing a lie. You, you didn't get what I said. So we have this idea about us and they. Oh, us and they. They, they are all going to hell. We are all going to heaven. We are all God's people. We are all, they are all devil's people. They are all lost. But the moment we say they are all lost, what we are saying is they already belong. You can never lose something that does not belong to you. You didn't get what I said. You can never lose something that does not belong to you. If you say you have lost something that belonged to you in the first place. So when you see the person who is outside and say they are lost, you are saying they are already with you in the first place. So the presentation of the gospel is not us versus them. The presentation of the gospel is us. There are only two categories as far as God is concerned. Everybody is there, is his kid. Everybody is his children. One group knows the heart of the father. The other group doesn't know the heart of the father. And the two group exist even within the church. <laughs> the two group even exist within the grace church. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, it exists everywhere. It, 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 it might be you. <laughs> it might be the preacher who doesn't have an understanding of the heart of the father. So he has got only two kids. The prodigal, the elder brother. Both of them didn't know the heart of the father. But both were lost because both were his sons. The coin is lost because it belonged. The sheep is lost because it belonged to the shepherd. It was not born in the wilderness and it didn't die in the wilderness. If it is that way, it is never lost because it never belonged. So when you understand the heart of the father and you understand the gospel and you understand the cross, you have a better revelation of who God is, you have a better revelation of who you are and you have a better revelation of who they are. If you can really say they. So the presentation of the gospel is not about including them. Come join us. The presentation of the gospel is, do you know that you're already in the triune dance of God? Do you know that you're already celebrated? Have you seen these movies where these heroes get up in the first scene and something bad really happens and they forget their origin, they forget where they are from and the whole movie is about finding who they are and finally they meet an old friend of the father who comes and says you are such a such a son and that becomes everything to him and that is the day of salvation for people when you go and tell, do you know who you are? Do you know who your dad is? Do you know to which family you belong to? You are thinking you are doing something here but you are not that way where you wake up to that reality out of the dream that you are lost and that happens by the proclamation of the gospel the gospel does not initiate reconciliation the gospel is a proclamation of the reconciliation so God in Christ was reconciling the world unto himself. The word reconciled, if you go and see the root word, it says kiss. God in Christ was reconciling the world unto himself. With that verse we finish 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19. That is, God was in, in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses. That word impute is an accounting term which means to count. What we were saying so long was on the cross, God counted every sin and punished Jesus. You guys remember? None of your sins were left out. All of his sins were counted. 
and it was punished justly in the body of Jesus. But here the Bible says, in the cross, at the cross, God was not counting. He was not in the process of counting sins. He was in the process of kissing the world unto himself. When the father was hugging the son and kissing him and all the, all the stones of the angry mob was just falling upon him, he was not counting the sins of the son. He was reconciling the son unto himself. Through his embrace, he was removing the lie that he had been living all along. So why don't we come to the cross? Look at him and say, why don't we come to the cross? Communion. Come in union. Come in understanding your authentic design. What you hold in your hand is God is not apologizing for your faulty design. He is proud of the authentic design. That's what you're holding in your hand. You need not be afraid of your weakness. Every threat is removed of the cross. You can go to him as you are and reach out to him. And talk to him about your weakness because he had made himself weak. It was not just incarnation. Incarnation to the level of he humbled himself to the point of death of, on the cross. Yesterday, we had to take a U-turn. We were really caught up in the traffic. No guy was allowing us to take a U-turn. We were just in the middle of the road like that in Kutralam. And I said, Solomon, just get down and, you know, help us to... He just jumped out of the car like that, every guy stopped. <laughs> the very... If, he, if, if, if Jesus had just become word, became flesh, probably still man would have been afraid. But he was so beaten and bruised and he was hanging there on the cross so that every form of threat is removed. He was so weak. He made himself so weak in which his strength was revealed. In which the wisdom of God was revealed. Where he reversed everything through resurrection. And he said a big no to all the stuff that has been plaguing you and haunting you so far. If still things are plaguing you and haunting you, you have not understood the union. You have not understood that you have been in the resurrection just as you were in the crucifixion. So all you need to ask is open my eyes to see. Open my eyes to see. Open my eyes to see.